Okay, so I will uh, get started. I will talking about uh, serverless computing, especially about self-hosting it on the Kubernetes cluster. So on-premise, open source, nothing of the, I will talk about the, uh, the big players also a bit, because you can't ignore them when talking about serverless, but we're mostly about self-hosted, serverless, open source, and also a bit about uh, CI and CD, since this is kind of the topic of, the, of today's conference or workshop. Anyway, so um, for those who don't, don't know what serverless is, I will give it a few general definitions about it. So we can argue about it on a general level. Then I will discuss a few use cases. And then we will talk about problems of uh, serverless in terms of uh, acknowledged research challenges and about observations and issues I found uh, when I worked myself with a few serverless platforms. Okay, so well, first up, what is serverless? If you look up serverless online, you find it's a cloud execution model, whatever that means. So uh, if you think about an application, then we uh, have in this application, we have many small functions that do usually one thing. And uh, if you are working in serverless, we are this, so these uh, functions is are our unit of operations. We are deploying singular fun functions. These are co uh, commonly containers or micro VMs. For our purpose, micro VMs are the same as containers. They uh, work, work somewhat differently internally, but they are um, the same as containers for our understanding right now. So uh, these, uh, this whole architect architecture is event driven. So the functions do not, do not do anything until uh, some trigger like an incoming HTTP request or some other trigger like a message queue message uh, comes in. So another important aspect is that um, we can scale these functions. We can deploy a single instance. We can deploy many, many instances or we can even scale down to zero. So if we don't need a function, we can just scale down to zero and we have nothing. So we consume, consume no. We consume no resources except uh, some storage for putting down our function. And we can scale it up if we, if there's a high demand. And this can even be done automatically. This is a high advantage of our uh, classical uh, versions where we would need to reserve uh, servers in advance. So we see, oh, there's uh, probably going to be a lot of traffic on our website. So we will uh, reserve a service in advance and we need to pay for all these uh, resources that we reserved. In case of um, serverless, we just lean back and we know if there is a big demand, it will automatically scale up. And as soon as the demand fades, it will scale down again. So uh, the whole thing is called serverless, but why exactly? For once, we are ignoring the exact positions of our functions. So we, if we're working uh, with a cluster and we say deploy this function or this container, it goes anywhere. It's similar to classical Kubernetes where we can just say, make a deployment of this container and the scheduler says, okay. And then it looks for uh, some place to put that container and we don't see it if we don't uh, care. So another important point is uh, usually if you, if you would deploy an um, application, then you would need to also deploy some uh, functions for logging, monitoring, scaling, or other such side tools uh, to keep it running. Uh, this is also kind of handled uh, centrally or not by, uh, doesn't need to be handled by the user in case of serverless because the platform itself deploys these functionalities. So for this small function that does one thing for our website, we don't need to do extra, uh, make an extra deployment of, uh, for a logging application, monitoring applications and whatever. It's just taken care of by need to handle logging or monitoring on our platforms uh, or ourselves because it's uh, done centrally. That's also I think uh, because usually we have the server stack, the server stack we have our application, the logging application, the monitoring application, it's it's got it's hidden, it's gone, it's serverless. So another thing about this uh, whole structure, it's commonly server uh, stateless. So, so stateless means our functions can have a local state, but uh, since they are automatically scaled up and down, we have no guarantee that this function will exist in five minutes or ten minutes or even in twenty seconds. So this local state uh, is wiped along, uh, is wiped when the function is scaled down, and there, so we are technically stateless. So uh, then there's also this main concept called uh, FAS or FAS, uh, similar to uh, SAS, software as a service. We have now function as a service, where uh, some public, uh, big public cloud providers uh, 
offer this uh, the service. As I mentioned earlier, you need uh, this is interesting for uh, because you only need to pay for resources that you actually consume. The obvious candidates are the three big players uh, in this uh, space: AWS, Google, and Microsoft. Mainly AWS, by the way. So if you look for resources about serverless online, it will, like 50% of the time, assume it's that you're talking about AWS Lambda. Because if you look at market shares, it's going down a bit, but it was at the during the last years, like AWS was like 80%, not a bit less probably the last few years or la last year. But it's like, uh, now that all guides have been written with AWS, or most, uh, most guides have been written with AWS in mind. So, um, if you're using any of these platforms to deploy your functions, uh, they will do, uh, uh, apply limitations to your function execution. So, a single function may only access so and so many, so much, so much ma uh, memory, and may only run for, what, five minutes or something, and then we uh, just cut short. If you are using an, uh, a self-hosted variant, you have more control. You can just configure it. There are also some horror stories online about people using these platforms for the applications, and then due to some error or to, uh, or to some endpoint that was exposed online, uh, there were way too many function calls made, and well, they pay as you go, and it went ever up and up, and suddenly you have a bill of 10k uh, when you're expecting 100. Uh, so yeah, put up some alerts, limits, whatever, so that doesn't happen uh, to you. Okay, so uh, serverless platforms. I will uh, build this on top of a paper from uh, Van Eyck, uh, who provide a reference architecture um, to describe service architecture, so we can argue about them in general. So, uh, the authors of this paper split up the architecture of these uh, platforms into three layers. So we have the resource orchestration layer, which for all purposes is just Kubernetes. Both Kubernetes takes care of uh, play, uh, providing containers. If you say we want a container, Kubernetes just does it. We don't care how Kubernetes does it, it just does it. That's our resource orchestration. Then we have the function management layer, which is uh, what we generally call a, a fast uh, platform. Because it all has all these features what were that we associate with FAS, with FAS. And then there's a workflow composition, which is mostly just an extension that builds on top of it, uh, so we can build com more complex workflows uh, from multiple functions, for example. So this uh, function management layer is in, in this paper, again, split into uh, six components. We have a, a registry, some place to put our functions, a builder, some place to build new functions, Deployer, that is just, that's just our scheduler. Function instance, instance. this is a, a tricky one because a function instance is technically one container in our terms that is able to take in a, in a request or an event, process it, and send it back. So, uh, but this, uh, from the perspective of this platform, the, it, this container contains the user code inside, and it's sort of like a bed. It is embedded, this user code, then it sees some, uh, something around it, like a web server that takes the incoming event and forwards it to the user function. And then there, are, then we have also the router, or well, that's, that's just, that's just an internal gateway that, uh, that uh, load balances and forwards uh, the requests uh, and events inside the cluster or incoming from outside, inside the cluster to function instances. And finally, we have some sort of autoscaler that uh, takes a metrics whatever metrics the platform just wants to handle and uh, scales uh, uh, the function instances up and down based on that. So uh, to have an example, this show is also from the same paper and shows a typical function execution pattern. If you have one or more deployment uh, function instances already, then the event comes in and is immediately executed and we are done. If there are no function instances, you need to perform a so-called cold start, which I will talk about a bit more later where we need to first uh, yeah, get the function from the registry, then uh, query our Kubernetes to uh, make a deployment for it, and then we can use it. So, talking about open source serverless platforms, here is a bunch, like should be 14, 14 um, logos of uh, open source serverless platforms that are all in active development. 
and have a small bit um, to decent or very big size. And yeah, can you guess how many of those support Kubernetes? I mean, for it's a bit obvious if they have K or cube or something in the name, but uh, truth be told, all of them support Kubernetes. Some of them can run without it, but uh, the in general, Kubernetes is like a core part of every decently big uh, open source serverless platform. So why is that the case? Why is serverless and Kubernetes such a good, uh, good uh, match that almost everyone just uses them together? So first off, you need a resource, or resource orchestration layer to work with a serverless platform. Kubernetes is a good option for that. I mean, you can also use Mestos or Nomad or something, but nobody uses those. And then we have um, is the fact that uh, all these features that Kubernetes already provides, so these components Kubernetes has, they map perfectly to uh, some of the function uh, management uh, layer components. So inside a cluster, we can man can, we can already manage container images. If you say Kubernetes deploys this container, it already knows how to download it to the right node and deploy it. So yeah, we all have part of our functional registry already done. Deployer is just a configured scheduler, we already uh, got that. Then we need uh, orchestration. We definitely got that. We can uh, deploy a function in the same container to multiple nodes or on the same node. Uh, we have internal networking. So we can route between nodes and containers and build just on top of that some gateway to control that and uh, to specifically load balance of uh, our content, our nodes, uh, our function instances, instances. So we also got that. And Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes course comes with autoscaler. So we can also use that. And then there are uh, some of the advanced features that uh, Kubernetes also offers. We can uh, make controls like uh, adjust resource limitations per uh, container. This is also something that's uh, very desirable if you compare it to what the public cloud providers are already doing, like limit execution times or memory available. And if you want to share a platform, you might also want to uh, um, limit uh, resources per, per node, uh, per, per function instance. And then we need um, these uh, tools for uh, what's called for logging and monitoring. If you look at the Kubernetes ecosystem, there's many tools that integrate very well with Kubernetes. Like I need something for logging, uh, logging and monitoring. Hey, I just use Prometheus and Grafana or something like that. There are so many options that are already very integrated. And if I would develop such a um, open source platform, I can just pick uh, those uh, those up, build a web server, just gobble it together, and we already have this open source serverless platform. Now give it uh, cool features, and we can only put it uh, public and sell it, or whatever you're going to do with the open source platform. So um, as you can tell from these features, even I wouldn't use the serverless platform uh, like, like the ones I showed bef uh, before. Uh, Kubernetes itself is already kind of a serverless platform. So, uh, but if you do choose to uh, use the serverless platform, what can we uh, expect from it? What components? So I um, already mentioned a few times, we have this gateway. Uh, we have this gateway, we can define routes and endpoints. So for example, um, an HTTP endpoint, so you have an, ad, some web address where I can send requests and they will be sent, uh, I'm guaranteed they will be sent to some function instance, a function instance of, uh, that I have configured for that. And they will be load balanced among the instances, instances I have. And then are those, um, templates, environments, runtimes. These, if you look at enough platforms, you get a new word for every platform almost. So they are, um, if you're talking about container images, they are just base images inside which we will deploy our user code. And it's somewhat interesting how they integrate, integrate the user code with uh, these, these base images, with this web server that takes incoming requests and forwards it uh, to our, our function. So I've seen a few variants of that. Um, the most universal one is just a sub-process where it just forks and call and uh, uses some uh, stream or something or something like that to forward the input data. But there are also uh, variants where you can do a native integ integration uh, using some sort of plugin or library variant where the user uh, code is defined as a plugin or as a library and then natively integrated with the host. I will talk about the advantages of that uh, on a later slide. <clears throat> then we also need to control our platform somehow. If you are using uh, some dedicated features of this platform, we also need a dedicated user interface. 
especially if those go beyond the typical Kubernetes stuff uh, and Kubernetes resources, so we can't use the standard dashboards. Some platforms also come with message queue integration, so we can use Kafka, RabbitMQ, or whatever um, data focused or not data focused um, queue system, uh, message queue system we want to use. And workflow, comp workflow composition is, all, is also among some of the more advanced features that some platforms already support. Okay, that was a lot to take in. Now, if you uh, got that, what uh, can we use it for? So we will uh, give a few use cases. So since we are talking about uh, continuous integration and development on this uh, conference, workshop, whatever, um, we also can use uh, serverless functions for this. We can uh, build serverless functions that automatically cre create and test our builds just on a trigger, like uh, uh, um, <clears throat> sentences, like a post uh, hook uh, trigger or something like that. So we already have, we already can build our well, our uh, GitOps stuff with that. Then we go can do web serving. So since it's a serverless function, you can just uh, deploy a web page, some simple web pages. We added. They should be stateless or only rely on an external data source like a database. But we can do some simple web uh, sites with that, and they scale really well as, have, as, as we have learned. We can also do uh, APIs, so just define an API endpoint with this, put uh, even a CDN cache in front of it, so we don't need to query our functions that often. We can do data processing, and we'll talk a bit about more about that on the next slide. Integration of third-party services, hybrid applications, so uh, we can write a whole application and put part of it as serverless, if you want to uh, have it scale uh, and or scale up and down based on demand, so if you have some functionality that is rarely needed or very uh, and some and if it's needed, it's needed a lot. That's a good candidate for a serverless function. And also, um, if you want to share resources, uh, since I've been talking about uh, that serverless, we can put all our, the code from multiple customers on the same host and run it next to each other. We have excellent resource sharing. And if the resources are expensive, like with GPUs, uh, thanks to the current chip shortage, that might also be a, a huge plus point for using serverless. So in general, yeah, we can also do this glue code. We can do security checks. You can do a lot of stuff with serverless. So talking about mentioning again, the data processing. So in general, just send data to a, a or a reference to data to a function, let it do its work and it comes back. Like set an image, the image is resized and it comes back and it's resized. Um, so if we do this one image, it's okay. But what if you want to do it with a thousand images? We don't want to send one by one, get it back. Now we, we have developed parallel computing. We can send multiple images at once, but you also don't want to sit around and wait for all images to, uh, to uh, go through the platform. No, we want to, we want to, want to be smarter. We say we use asynchronous processing. It's not supported on all platforms I've shown earlier. The bigger ones uh, do support it commonly. So the idea is uh, we send in the request, just get an acknowledgement back, and they are internally put into a queue. And then the platform will just work through that queue. And uh, uh, and when it's finished with all that, we can just send a call back and say, hey, I'm done with all the tasks you have given me here, the images, you can find them on that storage within the cluster. Uh, this is, goes also in the direction of workflow composition because it was just a one step thing. I sent 1000 images for one step processing and get them back. What if it's more complex? I need a multi stage processing. I might have a splitting paths or something. And if you work with data stream platforms, it might sound familiar because now we're getting into the direction of building data streams or data stream workflows. So, um, if it's all just about using, doing this, then you don't need serverless then just with the data stream platform. If you want to use all the other stuff like uh, like trigger-based scaling uh, zero to uh, infinite, uh, infinite uh, and so on, we uh, use serverless. But it's not a good replacement for a dedicated uh, data stream platform just to put that out there. Okay, so research challenges. These uh, serverless in general has a few problems. And since it's, especially since, it's, since it is a relatively new concept, and uh, based on these three papers, I've uh, aggregated a few uh, challenge, uh, challenges that I will go over now. So I'm already mentioned mention cold starts. 
So if I haven't used the function in some time, it's scaled to zero. So for the next request, we need to scale it up. And based on uh, what kind of uh, resource we are, or what kind of instances we are using, so VMs, container, and what resources they need to load, uh, it can take some time. So based on this, if we have scaled to zero, we can just go through, wrote the request, process it, we are done. But if you need to go through all these steps, creating a new instance, so find a place, down, uh, transfer our container over there, uh, start it up, then we need to load maybe some Python libraries. Maybe we're using NumPy, Pandas, or some other big libraries that take uh, take some time to load. And then we also need to initialize our user code, like connect to a database or something. And uh, only then we can use our stuff, and this might take a few seconds, uh, seconds or even longer to start up. So next, communication patterns. Serverless communication is quite naive. We have instances, we have our gateways, and we don't care about anything else. It's very simplified view. But if we want to optimize, we need to uh, perform things in batches, uh, or else we are sending a lot of requests uh, uh, back and forth, which is also shown in this uh, image, where if you ignore this uh, VM layer, where we say we have a VM and our in, well, host, and inside this host, we have multiple functions that could be aggregate and send their, just send their messages back and forth through a gateway, then we would save on a lot of uh, of requests. Right now, this is rarely supported, if if it even is supported or uh, even part of a platform. So that's, well, an open uh, challenge uh, to develop such, uh, such systems. Next, we have data locality. Also prepared an example here. So imagine we have a function, we call it function X. Function X requires some data to work. This data is in database alpha, which is uh, located in the data center in city A. We have a cluster that spans it, uh, I uploaded the wrong one. Uh, this should be, should be city B. Okay, we have city uh, A and this is city B. Just imagine it's city B. And um, so we are, uh, However, the database in uh, the data center on uh, city A is, already has a usage of 70%, and the other one has 20%. So our scheduler looks at the metric, sees 70% versus 20%, so we look to uh, utilize uh, um, the less used uh, data, uh, data center. But uh, it, uh, this will be further away from the database alpha where our data is located. So this is disadvantageous for the processing speed of that function. So it would be uh, a nice development if platforms would support uh, hints. So the developer could say, hey, this function will need data from such and such database. So the scheduler can look, oh, this database is there. So I might squeeze in this function anyway. This uh, is a simplified example. In reality, this might even apply inside a data center, where the connection speeds between no hosts or nodes are not uh, but the same, so we need uh, need to gather the data about latency and bandwidth between nodes, and make decisions based on that. But some smart systems, something something machine learning can figure it out, probably maybe. And then there's also the concept of stateful serverless. So I mentioned um, that the state of a function is of, of a function instance is gone as soon as that function is uh, as that container is removed. So what if it wasn't? What if we have some sort of ephemeral, temporary, or even persistent storage, maybe per node, that uh, could hold onto data? This would allow for some other use cases, like service databases, or we could even improve our um, data flow or, or workflows. For example, like a feature with checkpointing, which is something that is already standard for data stream platforms, uh, but would uh, but would need something like well, stateful service. How exactly this is supposed to work is some, somewhat in the air still. One of the platforms I showed earlier, for example, uh, it's called Fasm, uh, supports uh, host local uh, sharing of memory. So we can have some uh, states that we are safe outside of that function uh, on a host. Next, uh, security isolation. So since we are sharing our, uh, our hardware, we are also sharing the CPUs. And if you have learned anything about sharing resources of like CPUs, the, and uh, the whole reason why we do, why we, why we are doing virtualization is that uh, we want to isolate our applications from each other. 
either for malicious or accidental interactions or attacks between them. And uh, these can also happen on hardware level, so so-called Warhammer attacks. The recent years we had Spectre and Meltdown uh, that uh, abuse uh, memory uh, positioning and CPU features to uh, to read into the code or into the data of uh, other functions. So by default, most platforms are somewhat vulnerable to this. So if they do not uh, use a specialized uh, uh, container of VM isolation technologies. So that's why, uh, for example, Amazon Firecracker is a system for micro VMs. Because if you are using a micro VM, so very small minimized operating system instead of a container that shares the host uh, or the kernel, you have already a higher level of isolation. These uh, systems are somewhat complicated as they also need to be optimized very highly. Of course, we are, all, we are getting back to the other point with um, cold starts, where if we restart, uh, if we are starting in a whole operating system each time, then we are doing a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, then we are wasting a lot of time with uh, cold starts. So it's a trade off between isolate or security and performance. The last point is about performance isolation. Again, since we are sharing our host, we might get inconsistent uh, performance execution times uh, when we're running our uh, functions. So when running a function, we might want to expect like, okay, it will take so and so many seconds for it to return. But this might vary a lot since the host might be busy or not with other functions. And it might also need to perform a cold start and so on. So uh, there's the option that a scheduler could uh, take on information about uh, the resource requirements of functions or, uh, and cloud providers could sell this even as a feature. These are somewhat uh, open the air still and uh, not the standard. Okay, so those are the scientifically acknowledged uh, things about uh, services I found. I will go a few about a few um, observations issues I made when I worked with a few of these uh, platforms. So first up, testing, especially integration testing, is a bit weird. Since we are technically we need to run integration tests, uh, tests against the whole platform or against a serverless cluster, as it needs uh, as we want to observe how it scales up and down while we are running our tests. There are some tools for simulating this locally, but it's always kind of fuzzy if you do it locally and not 100% representative of the real system. If you look back at the predictions about um, about the issue about performance isolation and prediction, this also plays into this area. If you want, uh, as it might in real world, uh, vary a lot. Then the thing about vendor login, actually public cloud provider, they offer a lot of services around, uh, uh, offer a lot of services that uh, op integrate optimally with their own system. And so we, if you do use their own uh, stuff, you get better performance. But it also means a lot more work if you want to switch the platform later on. And now about performance impact. So um, if you think about uh, build, if building a pl an application, we write our code, and now we think, oh, you need to make a function. But do we make a serverless function? Then I always need to consider that while it's not explicit anywhere, it's always means a round trip to some function and back. And if you look at the times it takes like to process something locally on a node and to make a round trip to some platform and back. And then we should think, do we really need to make this round trip? This is okay. So I've got some latency here. Or do we just want the results immediately because it's our whole application uh, needs a stall because we need, on the, need to wait on this round trip. So these are all the factors that this uh, thing depends on. So the, uh, our code. The network setup we have, but also what we have more or less control about, the, what's the OpenFAS uh, platform, uh, what's the, what the FAS platform delivers uh, in, types, in terms of uh, implementations, how uh, performance they are. For example, function instances are commonly um, uh, concurrent or parallel, such that, uh, it, but not entirely, such that part of it uh, will end up uh, becoming a bottleneck. We also need to, uh, uh, <clears throat> we also can use, uh, we can also can use uh, plat um, so queues internally to avoid such uh, retries. Okay, to get to the finish now, um, one my last point is language support. You see Python, JavaScript, and Go is most commonly supported on most platforms. 
CNC uh, subplus support is very rare and mostly depends on uh, having a general purpose func uh, function instance that can be adapted for that. But this also brings back the issue of uh, performance as having to, uh, if, uh, using standard streams uh, costs us a bit of performance as we need to make co uh, copies of our data. We cannot reuse CPU caches as we are switching processes. So optimally, we want to use uh, the same uh, program language for our function instance and for our function code. Okay, so finally, to conclude this uh, drawn out uh, talk, if you want to make an application scalable or at least parts of it, you can use serverless. If you want to make some simple stuff like glue code integrations, you can use serverless. Also for seamless into uh, and for seamless resource sharing. While uh, serverless is growing massively as a field, as I've shown, there are so many platforms that are currently being developed with uh, new ideas and uh, concepts. To address some of these issues, there are still many open problems. And if you're just here for the data processing, just use the data screen platform. Okay, uh, thank you for listening to me, even if I went a bit over time. Are there 